But if you would like a copy of that, just send us word somehow, some way, smoke signals, Morse code, or whatever, and uh, we'll get it to you. But I am, I am, the, I have to go back now and finish that project. Um, I have to go back now to do all the editing and all the website posting, including the Watchman broadcast. I recorded uh, two hours today on uh, part two of Principalities, uh, and I, I, I think you're going to like some of the things I said in that. I think you're going to like that. Um, I said all that because I was going to tell you something that I knew about the King James Bible, and I don't have a clue what it was now. I just completely lost my mind. And even though I wrote down KJB, there was something that I said today uh, in the course of, of, of the Watchman broadcast that, oh, I remember what it was now. Uh, if you open your Bibles, and we're just going to run all over the place. I've got some pieces of paper to look at, and we're going to finish what we started uh, on Tewu's Day, dealing with uh, this number 46. But in Daniel chapter 7, here's what I'm doing uh, in this week's Watchman broadcast. I, I've started, I took this idea of the fourth kingdom, and we went to principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places. Everything falls in line with this number four. And you look at, we're looking at principalities, and I went back to Daniel chapter 7, because there are four beasts that rise up. And here's the interesting thing. In, in Genesis, God gave dominion of man. Man, he gave man dominion over the beast. In the end times, he is going to give beast dominion over man. Do you see that? So here we have rising up out of the sea, four beasts diverse from one another. Um, the first one is like a lion. Now, here's, here's kind of the, the, the direction I went with it. Because people can see, they look on um, like heraldry or nation's flags or nation, nation symbols. They, uh, over the course of thousands of years, nations or groups or people have used animals as symbols. So some, some have looked at the lion with eagle's wings um, saw the lion as Great Britain or England uh, and the eagle wings as America and America being separated from Great Britain and on and on and on. I can't say yea or nay to that. What I can show you from the Bible is what lions do, how they act, how they live, what their purpose is, and so on and so on. And lions don't like, lions represent, and these, these beasts here, represent these principalities, these, these spiritual authorities that subvert the Word of God. And I mentioned about certain rulers that have, been, have either been named or named themselves after lions. Um, from the days of, um, of uh, Robin Hood, you have um, John Coeur de Lyon. You have, or excuse me, not John, Richard. John was his brother. Richard the Lionhearted. He is a man with a lion's heart rather than a lion with a man's heart. And then you have Napoleon. Pardon my French. You have Napoleon. Leon, the Leon part of Napoleon is the lion. And I think, uh, I don't know what the Napa means or something like that. But anyway, somebody do some etymology on that and write me an email. But the Leon part of Napoleon is a lion. That was his name. He was a lion. Watch this now. A lion king. And I'm not, I don't know all the history of Napoleon and what he was trying to do and so on. But one of the things that I, that I caught on to, and I think this is a valid idea. When King James of England had this Bible written up and translated, he did copyright it as far as what was available at that time. And he had choices. He could have just let it go, but he didn't. It was not only in the king's heart to settle the religious schisms between the Church of England and the Puritans, but it was also in his mind to make sure that once that Bible was translated, not one group or the other altered its contents after it was translated. In other words, he said, if I'm going to put out all the expense and money and effort into this Bible, I don't want to do it and then have you guys go out and undo it. 
And so he put it under what was called in Britain a royal letters patent. And this, this is something that ap applies only to the monarchs of England. So he takes this Bible and every word of it is now protected by the king of England. But not just King James. It's protected by the crown. And I know in, in America we don't really understand that. Um, I've been watching a little bit of BBC America and just kind of getting an idea of the differences between America and Great Britain. And it's really interesting. Here in America, we, I've, I've been watching Law & Order UK because I like law stuff and I want to see how they work in, in uh, England. They still wear the wigs. And I get that. And the wigs, the judge and the prosecutors and the, the defense attorney, they all wear a wig. And from what I understand, that is to show that they are common amongst them, that not one is over the other. So there's a common headdress there. Looks funny. Okay. But anyway, uh, in America, it's a district attorney or a prosecuting attorney or a state's attorney, the state's attorney. In England, it is the crown prosecutor and when they when they speak in court uh, my lord the the crown wishes to do this the crown wishes to do that in other words these people speak for not the parliament not the house of commons or the house of lords they speak for the crown the monarch of england and so the crown of england owns the king james bible and under the royal letters patent you can't change the Bible, not, not the crown's Bible. You can't change it. You can't alter it. It cannot be corrupted because it's under the crown. What was Napoleon trying to do, the Lion King? What was he trying to do? He was trying to invade and take over Great Britain. Why? That's just a little island, right? He was trying to take them over. Had he accomplished that feat, he might very well have destroyed the monarchy, the crown, in England, thus nullifying the royal letters patent over the King James Bible. Hitler, an eagle, that was his symbol, the eagle. And people that were around Adolf Hitler, they, they'll tell you, the people that met Hitler, They'll say, for this, for this little squirmy-looking little short guy with this stupid mustache, this sounds better in German, when he walked into a room, there was a feeling. You, you just got this sense of his physical being and his presence in the room. You lay down and you worship this guy just from him walking in the room. You could just sense something. And I, I know for a fact that Hitler was possessed, no doubt about it. Here's this unassuming guy, mongrel, Bavarian German. And yet when he walks in the room and shakes your hand, you think that you're in the presence of a god. That's how they described him. Hitler, in his raid, I mean, he, he walked right into Poland, walked right into France. Somebody tried to, somebody offered on eBay a rifle, a French rifle, Okay. And they advertised it as never been fired and only dropped one time. Hitler walks right into France, takes over France. He then begins to bomb into oblivion London. Those of you who are in England, you probably have ancestors or relatives who have very vivid memories of the Blitz. And still to this day in England, they refer to the spirit that got them through the blitz. In other words, uh, Winston Churchill got up and fired that nation up and said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. <sighs> okay. Had Hitler successfully invaded Great Britain and deposed the queen or the king of England, the royal letters patent over the King James Bible would be nullified. Think about that. Anyway, what was I talking about before all that stuff? Uh, so anyway, Lindsay has a, has a beautiful baby boy, Uriah Antonio Higgs. Um, we went to the hospital 
Um, she she ended up going Tuesday to uh, to the to the doctor's office because she called Lisa. I walked in the door uh, Tuesday after the broadcast, uh, did all the things, I, and I went home and I said, you know, I want to take Sweetie Pie out. So I walked in the door, Sweetie Pie, get your stuff, let's go eat something. And she said, hang on. Lindsay said the baby hasn't really moved all day today. And she's waiting to hear back from the doctor. And I just stood there staring at the floor for about a minute. Because I just did a funeral of a baby stillborn. And I didn't know what I was going to do. So the doctor called back and said, why don't you come up here? And it's about a 45, 50-minute drive. Um, Lindsay used to work for this OBGYN. That's why she was using her. And they had a good relationship. So the doctor said, come on up here. So we all headed in that direction. And the doctor said, you know what? Let's go ahead and take this thing out. They had already planned a C-section on Lindsay because um, Uriah was standing tall inside of her womb and uh, he was not going to turn around and do what he was supposed to do in order to be born. Thankfully, in 20th and 21st century modern medicine, that baby is not an automatic dead baby. The problem with a birch breath, a breach, a birch breath, a breach birth is that uh, once one of the legs comes out, how do you get the rest of it out without ripping it apart? And there's always a chance that baby's going to die. Well, now they can just open it up and take it out and sew it back up and everything's fine. And uh, so needless to say, we didn't sleep Tuesday night. They gave, it's real funny because they gave Lindsay the option. You okay? Here's the schedule here of the, of the OR. Do you want the baby born on 9-11 or you want the baby born on Friday the 13th? So she said 9-11. So be here at 5.30 in the morning. So we didn't sleep Tuesday night or Monday night. We didn't sleep. And then what little you did sleep, we get up, you know, 4, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, and we head up to the hospital. And I sat there. They, you know, they had, we all, pretty much all got there together, Lindsay and Antonio and me and Lisa. And uh, they laid her on the bed, and they said, okay, first thing we're going to do is just kind of just get an idea of the heartbeat. And I'm sitting there scared to death. I am just, I am scared that we're not going to hear heartbeat. You know what those things sound like. About 145 beats a minute. I'm going, that's good. And then not about 7.30. I mean, it was about a 15, 20-minute procedure, and Antonio got to go in there. We didn't. And um, he's taking pictures and everything like that. And as soon as that baby's born, I just Lisa and I just broke apart and cried and everything else. This is a gift from God that God gives to sinners. He gives gifts to sinners. This is what he does. Don't ever forget that, people. Don't ever forget that in these times of grace that you and I live in, God is not rewarding and honoring the people who do good things. That's not what he's doing. He is honoring the cries and the tears of people who call to the name.